In this video, I want to deal with how do we use financial statements and, fin and financial statement analysis to get to the correct actions that we must make as business leaders. But first, I want to deal with the context in which we make the business decisions. The first thing that we all must do before we even come to financial statement analysis is to try and figure out what is happening in the external environment. And this is important because it creates a context in, in which our decisions have to be made in. So this is where you use tools like your pastel analysis to find out what is happening in, in the country or, in, or even with the G for globalization, because these days we look even beyond our, our borders. Uh, your Porter's five forces would be tools that you'd be using here to find out what will be happening in the industry that you are in. So all those tools that are helping you to look outside of the organization so that you understand what is available out to there, those you'll be using them for external environment analysis. You will then come in and do an internal environmental analysis. You are trying to figure out here with your internal environment what resources and capabilities do you have and how can you exploit them? So we will be using tools like your SWOT analysis, or capabilities, let's do that. The tools would be like your SWOT analysis or sometimes we call it the TAUS matrix because it then allows you to be able to figure out uh, how can you then exploit your strengths and your opportunities and avoid your weaknesses and your threats. Uh, you'll be using tools maybe like your BCG matrix from marketing to position your product so that you know what is happening. So the output of this is you've got a full understanding of all your resources and capabilities from a financial perspective, your physical perspective as well, your human resources, uh, your intellectual perspective as well, intellectual. Once you've got all of that, it then leads you to the next stage, which is where you will then be coming up with your strategy. And the basic here is how are you going to win? And you can use generic strategies, obviously. So we've got your cost leadership, where you are growing the business by increasing, uh, increasing quantity and lowering price, obviously, and differentiation. You're growing the business differentiation by increasing price. And you could be somewhere in the middle with your focus strategy, which is then a variation of the other two. So these form your strategy. How will you then win within the organization? Once you're done with that, you will then come up with your business model. And within your business model, you are defining how will you create value? How will you extract that value? And there we use tools like your business model canvas, which has then the nine components of your value proposition linked to your customer segments and how you will reach those customer segments through the different channels. How will you maintain the relationship with those customers uh, through customer relationships? And, and then once you've got to that, what revenue streams will it then drive for you? And then you can go on the value creation side. What key resources do you need and what key activities are required for your business to be able to do this? If you are short of any key resources or key activities, then you must find the correct key partnerships, which then drives your cost structure. All of these, when you put them together then, is where then your execution comes in. So as they come in together, and they may be emergent in nature because things change in the external environment, which then force you to do things either in the internal environment or strategy. But this is the context in which all your ratio analysis will always occur. And therefore, as we look at the ratio analysis, you must always remember that it's occurring within this execution. So any change outside in these four blocks will have to be reflected in the ratio that we then look at. So then when we look at the application, 
Uh, remember, with financial statement analysis, you can do an analysis based on two things. So this analysis can either be based against a particular benchmark, and this benchmark may be internal, or it may be external. Or you can do a time series analysis where we look at the same ratio, but over time. When it comes to benchmarks, sometimes, especially when your strategy is really a blue ocean type of a strategy or it's a disruptive innovation that you've never had before, you may not have benchmarks that exist out there. And therefore, it is incumbent on the leadership to come up with their own targets, which then can be used as the benchmark. So let's then look at the return on equity formula. I'm choosing this one as it is mostly reflective of the interest of the shareholder. But if you look at it in its components, it also carries components of interest to other stakeholders within there. So before you can analyze, you must know obviously what is the formula of that uh, ratio. So your return on equity is calculating how much net profit is this company generating for each rand or dollar of equity that has been invested? So your return on equity is your net profit divided by your equity. The first level of analysis is to create an expectation in your mind. What do we expect should be happening with this ratio? When it comes to return on equity, what should be happening to return on equity is your return on equity should be going up. And then to test that then mathematically, for return on equity to go up, what must happen to its components? So what must happen to net profit? Well, everyone would agree that net profit would then need to go up. And mathematically, the denominator in this case, which is equity, will have to go down. But that's not enough in an exam to say the, re the return on equity has gone up because net profit has gone up and equity has gone down. You'll have to go into the details of why. Why is that so? So your understanding of financial statements then comes in. But those financial statements, remember, are also sitting within the broader context in which the business finds itself in. I agree that there are possibilities where the return on equity could go up when uh, equity goes up. So, so in an instance where your equity goes up, there is still a chance that your return on equity could go up. But then the requirement then is for your net profit to go up at a much faster rate than your equities. But there is a chance that that could happen. So let's then look at how do you then go into the detail. With net profit, you would then look at the components of that net profit. And your net profit is generated from your performance, which comes from the income statement. And it will have your revenue minus your cost of sales. You will then minus all your operating expenses. You will minus your finance charges or interest. And then you will also minus your tax. So just looking at those components from your income statement, you can then look at the movement that they should be doing. So for net profit to increase, you expect that revenue should increase. So that's the first marker you should be looking at. Your cost of sales should decrease. Your operational expenses should decrease. Your interest, you want it to decrease. And your tax should decrease. So as you're commenting on the increase in net profit, you now have five different levers to look at and to comment on. But that's also not enough. What you should also do then to be able to give proper recommendations is to then go into the components of each line item. So if you look at revenue, revenue is a function of price multiplied by quantity. Obviously, in real life, what then happens is you've got a whole different marketing mix of lots of products at different pricing points, but the concept is always the same. You're multiplying those products with their price and your cost of sales would then be your cost multiplied by the quantity. Your operational expenses, you'll have fixed ones and you'll have variable ones. And your fixed ones would be a rent value or a dollar value depending on what is happening in the context of that business. And you will then have the variable ones like cost of sales being the cost multiplied by the quantity. And your interest will largely be a percentage and your tax will also be largely a percentage. 
Now, when you look at it this way, you can then comment on the increase in revenue in the context of the strategy that the company is in and also what is happening in the external environment. For example, let us say a company is using a cost leadership strategy. So they then decide that what they will do to grow is they will increase quantity. Now, if you increase quantity to try and increase your revenue, all your variable costs, which are driven by quantity, will in turn also increase. But if you are a differentiated company, you will then need to increase price. Uh, well, I'm assuming that's what you're aiming to do as a differentiated company. And because that price does not require a corresponding increase in quantity, what then happens is it then filters through to profit. But then that's where subjects like your marketing, communications, PR, maintaining a good brand becomes important because you will then, you may have to increase some of these operational costs to try and get the customer's mindset correct relative to your brand so that you can charge this price that you are aiming to charge as well. Your cost of sales, if you're a cost leadership company, it therefore means that your only path to growth is to ensure that your cost per unit is brought down. And this is what makes some uh, what can I call them? Programs that's called like the proudly South African problem, uh, proudly South African campaigns problematic at times because you may want to buy proudly South African, but if the cost per unit does not come down to allow you your path to growth, in your case, if you're a cost leader, if your path to growth is in volume, you need to have that cost per unit down. And therefore, you will go to anywhere in the world where they can get that cost per unit down. Your operational expenses, you're always trying to see the expense that you're putting in. What benefit does it give you in terms of not only increasing revenue, but potential of lowering or containing other costs as well? Your interest, obviously, we'll speak a little bit about this in financing, but you're trying to always source the lowest, uh, the cheapest form of, of interest. And the concept of weighted average cost of capital that you what you must have learned then comes in in this place so that you're always making sure that you're generating more value than what it costs you to actually pay and when it comes to taxation you will find some companies finding those tax havens all around the world and this is mainly a function of where are you based and you can have a you can hire clever people within your organization to then figure out how to minimize your tax burden Tax avoidance is legal, but tax evasion is legal. You have to pay tax, but there are ways of minimizing that tax liability. Okay, let's go to the bottom then and look at the equity component. If you remember from your balance sheet that uh, your balance sheet shows you all your assets and how those assets are financed through equity and liabilities. Well, that's the accounting formula. So assets equal equity plus liabilities. Using basic algebra, you can then work out that equity equals assets minus liabilities. So our equity component, as we look at it, we don't just look at equity. We then break it into its components, which is then your assets. And on the other side, you will minus your liabilities. Ugh, liabilities. And obviously, your assets and your liabilities carry components that are, are non-current, that last more than 12 months, or also current. So you've got differing types of assets and liabilities based on your business. But what is important here is to understand which direction they should be moving. So if equity equals assets minus liabilities, for us to reduce equity, what must happen to assets is that our assets must come down and our liabilities must go up. Our assets must come down and our liabilities must go up. If our assets increase, then equity would increase. So it's important that you, you, you get that framing right. It feels wrong because most of us have been taught from a young age the opposite of this formula. And I always say that we are taught the formula for poverty. And that formula says, my child, my child, buy more assets. So we're triggered to buy a car and another car, a house and another house. But just buy more assets. 
But once you say, oh, I've bought to those assets using liabilities, you shock your parents and you shock everyone else. But the people who are creating wealth understand the opposite of that formula to be true. You must have as little assets as you possibly can have. And if those, if you need those assets as much as possible, you must make sure that they are financed by someone else as long as the most important component of that is you must ensure that the benefit derived from that asset can exceed the cost of of, of paying that debt so to increase your, your to lower your return your equity to lower your equity you have to lower your assets and increase your liabilities and there are lots of examples in mainstream business these days that explain this for example, you think of companies like Uber. So Uber is in its job to be done. Concept is a business that makes net profit from transporting people in essence. And ordinarily what you would need is lots of assets. You would need vehicles here. And what do they actually have? Well, they have no vehicles there. In essence, they get liabilities from our vehicles and they then pay us our, our 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 component on this so they've got a, an operational expense which is an interest that then leaves them with that profit and no assets airbnb is the same if you're running an accommodation business you need lots of assets physical infrastructure built over a long time but they have none and they use our 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 buildings, our homes, our our apartments to generate that profit and they pay us our small component. So as you go in into your business and you make decisions within the simulation or outside, you don't just want to look at the answer, which is in this case, the return on equity, but to understand where does it come from and which levers do you have? Because now you can look, your return on equity can be driven by so many levers from a net profit perspective. If you look at its five different components and in extension, the five different components then go into sub components with your products and the types of costs you have. From your equity component, if you know which assets are required to generate that net profit, can you lower those assets? Can you finance them cheaply through debt as well? I hope this will assist. If you've got any questions, please don't hesitate to let me know.